as the new school year begins, I wanted to talk about an important report that came out about charter schools. And there are a lot of myths out there about charter schools that I think this report helps dispel. And so for those that don't know, charter schools are publicly funded but privately owned schools. They emerged in the 1990s and were sold as an innovative alternative to traditional public schools. At this time, there was a lot of talk about how the U.S. educational system was falling behind. And the idea was that if we could bring a market-based and competitive approach to education, we could see better results. Freed from regulation, charters could develop a unique curriculum and figure out what works best for the 21st century. And charters had been a relatively new phenomenon, and without a longer-term assortment of data, myths about the inherent support, superiority of charters have been allowed to persist unchecked. But now, almost 30 years into this experiment, we have more data and the results are not looking good. The Network for Public Education just published a report called Broken Promises, an analysis of charter school closures from 1999 to 2017. It is a comprehensive study that looked at all charter schools and how long they stayed open. After all, at the most basic level, one judge's success would be if a school can even keep its doors open. They also look at data from specific cities, especially those with high poverty, as these are the communities that charter schools claim to be helping the most. Let's start with New Orleans, which is somewhat of a unique sample. After Hurricane Katrina devastated the city, school privatizers saw an opportunity and the entire city school system became privatized. This has only brought more instability, the report says. It says charter churn is baked into the New Orleans model. More than 35 charter schools in the city shut down between 2006, the year following Hurricane Katrina, and 2017. Surviving schools are frequently taken over by new operators who often have a very different mission and vision for the school. The days of stable schools rooted in New Orleans communities and governed by local elected school boards are gone. Charters appear and then they are gone. The promise of better opportunities for local children has become a promise broken over and over again. And it gets even worse at the national level. The report goes on. Between 1998 and 2015, more than 9,000 charter schools in the U.S. opened and enrolled students. However, more than 3,700 of those schools closed. Of the 606 charters that began serving students in 99, only 256, or 42%, were still open in 2017. Now, some charter school advocates try to argue that this constant churn is actually a good thing. It's good when bad schools are forced to close. It helps innovation keep happening. But anyone, whether a student, parent, or teacher who has experienced the school closing, knows that it only causes disruption that is terrible for education, let alone social and emotional health. There are endless heartbreaking stories of sudden charter school closures upending communities. Ashe Preparatory Academy in Seattle closed literally one month after opening, stranding 140 elementary school children. Conditions have become so bad that teachers just quit en masse and stopped coming to work. In Tennessee, Nashville's New Vision Academy charter school suddenly closed mid-year after safety violations, overcrowding, and financial issues. The school actually never had an occupancy permit and 158 students had to scramble to find a new school. So many of you are probably wondering, how can so many chargers be closing like this when it's so bad for children's education? And you're right to wonder this, but in some ways it's missing the point. This is what happens when you introduce the business model to education, which should be a public good. What does make sense or what doesn't make sense for education makes a lot of sense for the bottom line of profit. The Broken Promises report, I think, put it best when it said, Success in the prevailing competitive model of education depends on many things, but first and foremost on filling enrollment goals. If founders are struggling to keep the school afloat, it is in their narrow self-interest to keep staff and families in the dark lest they leave the school, thus accelerating and ensuring its downfall. We now have 30 years of data on charter schools, and the numbers don't lie. They have not proven to be the shiny new savior of education that they claim to be. And while we know charters are privately owned, it can be hard to trace exactly how people profit from charter schools. Often they are classified as or mixed up with nonprofits, blurring the lines of their financial operations. Charter schools usually become registered as a nonprofit that gets funding from the state and then gives these funds to a for-profit company to manage the school and provide services. Recently, Jackman interviewed Carol Burris from the National or the Network for Public Education, who described how this process works, saying, 
the for-profit then either directly provide services from management services to cafeteria services, or they contract out with another for-profit company to provide services. Either way, the goal is to run the charter school in such a way that there's money left over. And the more money they save by doing things like hiring unqualified teachers and refusing to teach students with special needs, the more money is left at the end of the day. And this gets at another way the data of charter schools can be skewed in an unfair way. Public schools have a commitment to get educate all children, including children with special needs. We cannot deny a child because they require extra resources or make our task in a classroom more challenging. Any teacher knows that having a classroom with multiple students with individualized educational needs can change the whole dynamic. But the profit making does not stop at the services the for-profit company provides. It also extends to real estate. And so Carol Burroughs also explains, Real estate is another way management companies often use to make profits. They get all kinds of tax advantages and low interest loans to buy a property, and then they lease the property at a big profit to their charter schools. Public money goes into the charter nonprofit and goes out to the for-profit real estate company, which owns the building. So essentially you have the taxpayer paying the mortgage. And then after the mortgage is paid off, they'll sell it to the charter school at an inflated price. And what's worse, there's virtually no oversight over these financial operations, unlike with public schools. This is partly why when a charter suddenly closes due to fraud or mismanagement, it comes as a shock to the students and the public. In public schools, school districts are elected or at least appointed by an elected official like a mayor. If you don't like what they're doing, you can vote them out. The boards of nonprofits are privately appointed, and many charters have billionaires and their friends sitting on the board overseeing operations they make money off of. This complete lack of oversight leads to countless scandals of fraud and mismanagement. In San Diego, heads of the A3 charter school were found guilty of embezzling $210 million through their school. They also bought children's personal information to falsely enroll them in the schools and pocket the money that was provided for services for these non-existent students. In 2018, the owner of the Goodyear charter school in Arizona was accused of fraud, which led to a sudden closure of the school. And let's take a look at that incident. Standing behind their attorney, former teachers and staff of the now shuttered charter school are accusing the school's owner of using state funds to live a life of luxury. There were things that were purchased uh, on personal credit cards that, that school funds were used to pay off. The janitorial staff for the school used to clean his personal residence. He's talking about this man, Daniel Hughes, seen here in a 2015 interview. Hughes sent out this email to parents and teachers last Monday stating financial woes had made it impossible to keep the school open despite already receiving more than $2 million from the state. Attorneys for the teachers say those problems were self-inflicted. The cooks from the school used to cater and sponsor parties at his house, his daughter's first birthday party. These these aren't these aren't allegations. These are facts. Now, to be fair, these kinds of examples are exceptionally bad, and there are many charters that operate without scandals. And of course, mismanagement can and does happen in public schools. But the sheer volume of instances involving charter schools, resulting from the clear lack of transparency and oversight, indicates that there is a big problem here. And I want to be clear: the enemy here is not parents. That's send their kids to charter schools or students or teachers. Many families send their kids to charters because they face a very difficult and practical choice. If their public school is chronically underfunded and doing terribly, it's hard to blame them for wanting to give charters a try. So we need to be careful not to target the wrong people. Also, we need to be able to talk about this with a degree of nuance. I used to substitute teach in charter schools in Philadelphia for a couple of years, which gave me a broad picture of a wide array of charter schools. Now, some of the charters are taught at were worse than average public schools. Many were around the same, and some were better than the average public schools. But for, for those that were better, it was clear why. They had a lot of resources, a lot of programs, small class sizes, a brand new building. They got public money plus private money, and these resources made a better outcome. So the point is that it's not much of a secret of what makes schools good schools. They need robust funding and support to create quality conditions and programs. Of course, public schools that have been drastically underfunded for generations are not going to be doing well. We need to support our existing public schools properly. Then parents won't be forced to make a choice about whether they're sending their kids to a charter or not. 
Families in affluent communities with well-funded public schools don't need to make this choice, and that's what everyone deserves. While we should be understanding of why families choose charters and not target them, ultimately we have to follow the money and be clear about what the overall project of charter schools is and how they actively damage public schools. Remember, charters receive public funding, funding that could and should be going to existent public schools. Let's listen to educators in California talk about how charter schools affect their school funding. And what's happened with the proliferation of so many charter schools is that sometimes it just becomes a parallel school district and it actually bleeds away money from the neighborhood schools. When a student leaves to attend a charter school, the money we spend to educate them follows. But the student's old public school can't reduce its cost by that same amount. It can't spend less for AC or heat. Its principal can't work part-time. To make up the difference, the school has to cut arts and music classes, lay off its librarian or nurse, clean its bathrooms less, or pay teachers so little they need another job to support their families. A first-of-its-kind study of three California districts found that on average, charter schools are taking over $1,000 a year from the education of each neighborhood school student. Charter schools cost San Diego's district nearly $66 million during the 2016-17 school year alone. In a state where public schools already struggle for resources, allowing more charter schools is making things worse for many students and threatening the very meaning of public education itself. Well, the value of public education is critical because it's the underpinnings of democracy. Because every single student that comes through our door Unlike charter schools, we accept, and we must serve and give them the best possible education. And there's a cost to serving any student that comes across our threshold. We need to invest in our public schools, and not even just for education's sake. Public education has been central for creating and sustaining our democracy. Again, it is a commitment to invest in every child, no matter their class status or race or whatever is going on in their life. It's not a coincidence that public education came to the South as part of the wave of reforms that took place after the Civil War during Reconstruction, that brief period of time when African Americans could and did exercise their democratic rights before Jim Crow. And public schools were seen as crucial to the advancement of Black communities. Author Derek W. Black wrote eloquently about the connection between public education and our democracy, saying, over and over again, when America makes big leaps forward and guaranteeing the right to a public education, it's articulated as a necessary component of fulfilling the promise of democracy. This thread runs throughout American history. Each moment that democracy is expanded, such as with the first and second reconstructions, public education has been massively expanded too. And each moment that doc democracy is contracted, such as with Jim Crow and the backlash to the civil rights movement, the assault on public education has happened alongside that contraction. But I do think the tide is starting to turn and more people are beginning to see it. As I said before, charters are no longer the shiny new kid on the block. We have a wide body of experience with them and are seeing the results. More organizations are turning a critical eye to them. A few years ago, the NAACP and the Movement for Black Lives came out and demanded a moratorium on new charter expansion citing their role in increasing school segregation. Let's, let's listen to NAACP official Hillary Shelton talk about it. What we had during those times and thereafter with part charter schools that were being put in place in many places to undercut many of the policies and protections civil rights has provided. Things like, for instance, making sure that us t uh, teachers at least have a degree and are certified before they teach. That's a minimum standard. Many charter schools went around that and even hired teachers without degrees at all, creating all kinds of other problems. We had charter schools that were carpetbaggers. That is, they'd come in and before they could figure out that the charter school was not providing the service, the charter school was gone. Now look, you're right. There are some charter schools that have proven effective, but if you go back and talk to the assistant uh, secretaries for civil rights uh, in the Department of Education, the last two, you'll find all the suits that have been filed because charter schools are being utilized in places like Mississippi, mm -hmm. Alabama, and North Carolina as tools to maintain segregation. So in essence, that's why we're calling for a moratorium. We've got to take a closer look at this. There's a big problem with how these schools are being utilized in so many areas. There is a deep connection between what goes on in charter schools and what goes on in your neighborhood public school. As some viewers know, I've taught in Philly public schools for the last five years. 
I've talked about the terrible conditions most schools face. 80-year-old buildings with mold, lead, and asbestos, roofs caving in, classrooms of 40 students. And at the same time, we see brand new charter school buildings going up. Of course, those children deserve to have a good building, but we can do that for all public schools and not drain money away from some schools to give to others. The charter school movement is part of the overall new liberal project to privatize more and more aspects of our lives that should be social. Education is about developing our capacities as human beings to the fullest. The profit motive does not have a role here. And as the data shows, for-profit education is not even succeeding by its own standards. So I'll end with a line from a public school teacher, Peter Green's blog in the Huffington Post, where he says, modern charters are not public schools and they do not make a public school commitment to stay and do the work over the long haul. They are businesses and they make a business person's commitment to stick around as long as it makes sense to do so. That does not make them evil, but it does make them something other than a public school. And it underlines another truth. Students are not their number one priority. So Anna, curious your thoughts on this. And you know, it's a different, difficult thread we have to walk because, you know, charter schools often use the rhetoric of civil rights and racial justice, and we should call that out, but we should also understand, you know, why they can make that claim and why, um, you know, it resonates because where are our schools underfunded the most? Mostly low income, black and brown communities. So people are seeing that and responding and, and the charter option looks attractive. But I think, you know, ultimately we've got to understand what this project is about. Yeah. And I mean, you know, earlier in the show, we were talking about the right wing and its decades long project in regard to the Supreme Court. They also have um, a, a long term project that's unfortunately been pretty successful in defunding the public education system to the point where it starts to, you know, uh, fail students and their parents, of course, take notice. And then their parents feel like the only real option is either private schools or charter schools. So it's it's just incredible because they they suck the funding out of these schools and then point to the schools and say, look at that. They're failing your right. students. They're failing your children. And um, it, it, I, I'm so grateful that we have people like you who are um, calling out this strategy clearly while also simultaneously showing how uh, these privatized schools or these privately run schools essentially serves as an avenue to redistribute resources um, from the taxpayer to the elite. I mean, really, right. I mean, when you consider the um, wealthy individuals behind this movement, you get a sense of the profit motives behind it as well. Right. And so, yeah. And yeah, I mean, and the, the report is so damning. I mean, the amount that have closed, I mean, they are failing on the, even their own terms, even on the terms of standardized testing, which I don't think are good ways to judge schools. Like they're not even proving to be good at that. Um, but again, I think the tide is starting to turn. More people are looking at it with a critical eye. And I think the idea that we need to fund public education is at least more more popular now than maybe in like 2013. So that's one one step in the right direction. Yeah. I, you know, I, I have a question for you, though. I, I'm wondering, you know, teachers in particular have just been so they've been mistreated um, and uh, underestimated, undervalued for such a long time. Is there difficulty in, in hiring new teachers? Um, is there a shortage of teachers? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially, you know, in districts like, I mean, the Philly Public School District or in these cities where it's been underfunded, that's a big problem. Um, and, you know, it's kind of this chicken or egg situation where, like, we're, we're, we need to hire more teachers, but we're never going to be able to do it unless we improve conditions. Um, and not just their pay, although that is definitely important, but, you know, the overall conditions of the school. And mm -hmm. I think an even bigger problem is not even just the shortage initially, but the, the, the amount of time teachers stay. And so the average uh, um, in Philly is like three to five years. Like if you if you stay five wow. years, you're like a veteran. And and again, it's because it's not that these teachers are bad people, but like I think many of us are just thrown in this impossible situation. We somehow have to make magic out of, you know, this chronic disinvestment um, and, and people leave out of frustration. So if we're ever going to retain teachers, you know, we need to improve the conditions. But yeah, I mean, it's a constant problem of getting enough teachers um, to go in the situation. But, you know, even on that point, I mean, this is actually a big problem with charters as well. Now, charters, one thing about them and another reason why they push them is they're non-union. Um, a few of them, sometimes they'll be able to organize, but they start out as non-union. 
And that means like they're often like really, really overworked. Um, they're work like crazy. They, they basically try to get a young, idealistic, like 22 year old burn through them in two or three years. So um, turnover is actually probably even worse in charter schools than in some public school districts. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way you'll enjoy all of our backlog as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.